Long before any man had reason to doubt Princess Rhaenyra's innocence, the question of selecting a suitable consort for Rhaenyra had been of great concern to King Viserys and his small council. Great lords and dashing knights fluttered around her, vying for her favour. When Rhaenyra visited the Trident in 112 AC, the sons of Lord Bracken and Lord Blackwood fought a duel over her, and a younger son of House Frey was so bold as to openly ask for her hand. In the Westlands, Sir Jason Lannister and his twin, Sir Tyland, vied for her during a feast at Casterly Rock. The sons of Lord Tully of Riverrun, Lord Tyrell of Highgarden, Lord Oakheart of Old Oak, and Lord Tarly of Horn Hill paid court to the princess, as did the hand's eldest son, Sir Harwin Strong. Breakbones, as he was called, was heir to Harrenhal, and was said to be the strongest man in the Seven Kingdoms. Viserys even talked of wedding Rhaenyra to the Prince of Dawn, as a way of bringing the Dornish into the Seven Kingdoms. Queen Alicent had her own candidate, and seemingly a sensible suggestion given the issue of succession. Her eldest son, Prince Aegon, Rhaenyra's half-brother. But Aegon was a boy, the princess ten years his elder. Moreover, the two half-siblings had never gotten on well. All the more reason to bind them together in marriage, the queen argued. But Viserys did not agree. The boy is Alicent's own blood, he told Lord Strong. She wants him on the throne, over my daughter. The best choice, the king and his small council finally agreed, would be Rhaenyra's cousin, Laenor Valarian. Though the Great Council of 101 AC had ruled against his claim, the Valarian boy remained grandson of Prince Aemon Targaryen and great-grandson of the old king himself. Such a match would unite and strengthen the royal bloodline and regain the Iron Throne, the friendship of the Sea Snake, with his powerful fleet. One objection was raised. Lord Valarian was now 19 years of age, yet had shown no interest in any woman. Instead, he surrounded himself with handsome some squires of his own age and was said to prefer their company but Grand Maester Melos dismissed the concerns out of hand. What of it? he said. I do not like the taste of fish but when fish is served I eat it. Thus the match was decided. King and council had neglected to consult Princess Rhaenyra however and Rhaenyra had proven to be very much her father's daughter with her own notions about whom she wished to wed. The princess knew all about Laenor Valarian's reputation and had no wish to be his bride. My half-brother would be more to his tastes she told the king. The princess always took care to refer to Queen Alicent's sons as her half-brothers, never as full brothers. Although Viserys reasoned with her, pleaded with her, shouted at her and called her an ungrateful daughter, no words of his could budge her, until the king brought out the question of succession. What a king had done, a king could easily undo, Viserys pointed out to Rhaenyra. She would wed as he commanded, or would make her half-brother, Aegon, his heir in place of her. At this, the princess's will gave way. Certain Eustace says she fell to her father's knees and begged for his forgiveness. Mushroom, on the other hand, that she spat in her father's face. But both agreed that in the end, she consented to the match. That night, Certain Eustace reports that Sir Kristen Cole slipped into the princess's bedchambers to confess his love for her. He told Rhaenyra that he had a ship waiting for them in the bay and begged her to flee with him across the narrow sea. They would be wed in Tyrosh or Old Volantis where her father's writ did not run, and no one would care that Sir Christum had betrayed his vows as a member of the King's Guard. His prowess with a sword and a morning star was such that he had no doubt he could find some merchant prince to take him into his service. But Rhaenyra refused him. She was the blood of the dragon, she reminded him, and that meant more than to live out her life as the wife of a common sellsword. And if Sir Christum could set aside his King's Guard vows, why would marriage vows mean any more to him? Mushroom tells a very different tale. In his version, it was Princess Rhaenyra who went to Sir Criston, not him, to her. She found him alone in the White Sword Tower, barred the door and slipped off her cloak to reveal herself naked underneath. I saved my maidenhead for you, she told him. Take it now as proof of my love. It will mean little and less to my betrothed, and perhaps when he learns that I am not chaste, he will refuse me. But Sir Criston was a man of honour and true to his vows. Even when Rhaenyra used the art she had learned from her uncle Daemon, Cole was not to be swayed. Scorned and furious, the princess donned her cloak again and swept out into the night, where she chanced to encounter Sir Harwin Strong, returning from a night of revelry in the stews of the city. Breakbones had long desired the princess and lacked the Sir Christian's scruples. It was he who took Rhaenyra's innocence, according to Mushroom, who claimed to have found them in bed at the break of day. However it happened, whether the princess scorned the knight or he, her, from that day forward, the love that Sir Christian Cole had formerly borne Rhaenyra Targaryen turned into loathing and disdain. The man who had been the princess's constant companion and champion became the most bitter of her foes. Not long thereafter, Rhaenyra set sail for Driftmark on the Sea Snake, accompanied by her handmaidens, two of them daughters of the Hand and sisters to Sir Harwin. The full mushroom and her new champion, none other than Breakbones himself, 
In 114 AC, Rhaenyra Targaryen, Princess of Dragonstone, took to husband Sir Laenor Valarium, knighted a fortnight before the wedding, since it was deemed necessary that the prince consort be a knight. The bride was 17 years old, the groom 20, and all alleged that they made a handsome couple. The wedding was celebrated with seven days of feasts and jousting, the greatest tourney for many years. Amongst the competitors were Queen Alicent's siblings, five brothers of the Kingsguard, Sir Harwin Strong, and the groom's favourite, Sir Geoffrey Longmouth, known as the Knight of Kisses. When Rhaenyra bestowed her garter on Sir Harwin, her new husband laughed and gave one of his own to Sir Geoffrey. Denied Rhaenyra's favour, Kristen Cole turned to Queen Alicent instead. Wearing her token, the young Lord Commander of the Kingsguard defeated all challengers, fighting in a black fury. He left breakbones with a broken collarbone and a shattered elbow, but it was the Knight of Kisses who felt the fullest measure of his wrath. Cole's favourite weapon was the Morning Star, and the blows he rained down on Sir Lenor's champion cracked his helm, left him senseless in the mud. Taken bloody from the battlefield, Sir Joffrey died without recovering consciousness six days later. Mushroom tells us that Lenor spent every hour of those days at his bedside and wept bitterly when the stranger called him. Sir Lenor returned to Driftmark thereafter, leaving many to wonder if the marriage had even been consummated. The princess remained at court, surrounded by her friends and admirers. Sir Kristen Cole was not amongst them, having gone over entirely to the Queen's party, the Greens, but the massive and redoubtable breakbones filled his place, becoming the foremost of the Blacks. At Rhaenyra's side at feasts and balls and hunts, her husband raised no objections. Lenor Valarian preferred the comforts of high tide on Driftmark, where he soon found a new favourite in a household knight named Sir Carl Quarry. Thereafter, though he joined his wife for important court events, where his presence was expected, Sir Lenor spent most of his days apart from the princess. Certain Eustace estimates they shared a bed no more than a dozen times. Mushroom concurs but adds that Carl Quarry often shared that bed as well. It aroused the princess to watch the men disporting with each other, and from time to time the two would include her in their pleasures. As often is the case with Mushroom's testimony, he contradicts himself, as elsewhere he claims that the princess would leave her husband with his lover on such nights, seeking her own solace in the arms of Sir Harwin Strong. Whatever the truth of these tales is, it was soon announced that the princess was with child. Born in the waning days of 114 AC, the boy was a large, strapping baby with brown hair, brown eyes, and a pug-like nose. For clarity, it should be pointed out that Sir Lenor Valerian had an aquiline nose, silver-white hair, and purple eyes that spoke of his Valerian heritage. Lenor's wish to name the child Joffrey was overruled by his father, Lord Corliss. Instead, the child was given an additional Valerian name, Jacaris. To friends and his brothers, he would be called Jace.